Thank you for joining us for the roundtable discussion to inform and educate on this topic to support your program further. And who better to inform us and provide us insight than expert individuals in the industry? So everybody give a warm applause to our panelists. Before we begin this session, I do want to note that these workshops are being recorded. They will be edited and made provided to you as soon as uh, possible. So we will begin with introductions. Immediately after introductions, we will go into a few areas of concentration where they will answer a few questions. And then after that, we will open it up to the audience for a Q&A, 15 minutes. So let's go ahead and jump into introductions. Well, hello, everyone. Very glad to be here in this beautiful garden today, um, along with my wonderful panelists here. Uh, I am Danielle Ullman, and I am the director for Stater Brothers Charities, which is the nonprofit for Stater Brothers Markets. And I have the privilege of overseeing um, our grant funding, different fundraising campaigns, and fundraising events. Um, so again, just very happy to be here today and um, help support all of you. Good afternoon, everyone. And first of all, I just want to thank Feeding America for putting this really great opportunity together for us to connect and network and learn and grow. Um, it's very nice, especially, again, I know we're still getting used to in-person events, um, but I just wanted to thank them for, for doing all the hard work and doing this. Um, good afternoon. I'm Kathy Paredes. I'm the Inland Empire Market Executive for Bank of America. What does that mean? Um, it means that I support the community with ph uh, philanthropy and sponsorships, as well as volunteerism. I know that was a big topic earlier, and we were definitely um, all trying to learn more on how we can connect with our volunteers in the community. We have about 2,000 employees in the Inland Empire um, who donated about 20,000 volunteer hours last year. Um, and in addition to that, though, we also have volunteer grants. So if you do have a Bank of America employee that's volunteering at your organization, remind them that if they can do 50 volunteer hours, then they can actually do a $500 volunteer grant to your nonprofit. So it's just another way that we have uh, you know, to, to contribute to the community in addition to um, community partnerships. So I live in Riverside, so I'm grateful to be close today. And again, thank you all for having us. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Cecilia Arias, and I work at Kaiser Permanente here in Riverside. I serve as the community health manager. I definitely wanted to also thank the Feeding America organization and team for the work that they've done. But next to you, to, next to Feeding America, I think everyone in this room or in this space has really done an amazing job. I know that there was a response during COVID that really required you all to step up in probably ways you didn't think you could, but you did. And now that you're here, you can hopefully take a little time to build yourself up, build your organization up. And I think this event and all that you've learned so far is gonna help you get a little further than you were before COVID. I think you guys did fabulous. So I want everybody to give each other a hand for all that you guys did. Fantastic. Thank you so much. We will go into the questions that we have this afternoon. And so the first question I wanted to ask you ladies is, you know, there's a lot of nonprofit organizations here uh, that grant funding is new to them. So the first question will be, how do I know what to apply for? Where do I start? Okay, since I have the microphone. Um, uh, first of all, I do want to share another resource. Um, it, the Inland Empire Funders Alliance is something that, oh, hi, more, more closer, okay, got it. The Inland Empire Funders Alliance is another resource, if you're not aware of, that has a, a resource directory of all the funders for the Inland Empire, um, because I know that if you are new to um, kind of exploring grant applications, that might be uh, a great way for you to go instead of just Googling and you know trying to figure it out yourself. Um, but you know, again, you want to try to see what resources we have, and, and that's actually a really, really great resource. 
Um, it is, you know, actually, and, and there's a lot, again, Slow Academy Go is another great resource in our community. Um, they have a fundraising workshop, especially for those who are new to, again, that, that whole grant application. So there's definitely opportunities out there and resources so you don't have to just, you know, start from the bottom um, because the work's already been, been done and, and created. And, and those workshops are, are also available um, for you. So just make sure you, you check those out. And um, I forget what, what else. Let me, let me pass this on to uh, some, somebody else can share. I, just to add to that, another way you can also find out is just look at somebody's websites if they have a charity portion or a grants program. But a lot of times guidelines are posted on people's websites so that you can make sure you're applying for something they would consider funding. And that's one of the first steps you probably do want to do is who's funding the programs you do. You're doing food security, you're doing access to food, you're doing um, an, a service to a population. Grant funders want to fund in areas they've already prioritized. So to make your time worthwhile, you do want to, you know, do the homework on their website on what they're willing to fund. Because the time of a grant writer or your time, if you're a small staff, is precious. And I know a lot of times you write grants and when you get the no answer more than you get the yes answer, you know how precious that time is. So um, also look at their websites. Yeah, I'd like to just add to that, Cecilia. I think, yeah, number one, do your homework, do your research. Familiarize yourself with the funders. Um, make sure your mission aligns with their mission. Um, that's, I would say that's number one. Because um, as grant funders, it's not a one size fits all, right? We all have different funding priorities. Uh, we have different grant cycles. I mean, it's not a one size fits all. So I think just definitely do your homework. Um, look on the organization's website and just try to familiarize yourself and get as much information as possible. Again, looking at the funding guidelines. And if you're still not sure or if it's still unclear, reach out to them and ask. That's what we're here for. We want to make sure that you succeed and we want to be able to support you in that. So if you ever are just unclear on anything, reach out to them. And I think also that's a great opportunity to really make an introduction to the funder um, so you could introduce your organization to them. So when you do apply, um, it's familiar to them and they're, they're aware of it. So um, I guess that would be my recommendation. Thank you so much. And, and like you mentioned, and I don't think everybody takes uh, advantage of that, of reaching out, building that relationship, and asking questions. Because a lot of the times, they answer based on how they understand it, and it could be that they not get rewarded because of that. So reaching out, because it also shows that they're committed and invested in the grant. So thank you so much for that. Next question I have is, you know, we have organizations as well that have grants. And the next question is, how do I sustain my grants and get renewals? Um, personally, for me, uh, comes down to donor stewardship. Um, like she said, you know, just make those connections, cultivate those relationships. Um, keep us updated. We want to hear progress. We want to, you know, send us newsletters, send us impact reports, progress reports. It doesn't have to be every month, you know, send it quarterly. It could be through email, something really short and simple, but just keep that relationship going because that is what really is going to build that trust with the funder. For example, there's been an organization that we've been funding for over 10 years now, and the rep, we are, <laughs> we're communicating through text <laughs> now. So um, I just think really just focus on that donor stewardship, cultivating those relationships um, to build that trust. I'll just add that um, a lot of uh, charitable or foundations um, don't do multi-year or they, um, so you do have to apply every year. And with that being said, um, I think as the, as the economy changes, as the community needs change, I think you know, funders are also looking for how are you adapting. So while you might have gotten a grant in 2020 in the midst of COVID and, and you know, we were all doing things differently and trying to reach folks, 
we, we, you know, now we're in 2023 and things are a little bit different, you know, the, so I think you do need to continue to adapt and, and, and show that you're being flexible and, and responding to the different needs of the community, whether it be, you know, what's happening with CalFresh benefits or, or whatever else that that's going on. I think, you know, you can't just kind of cut and paste the same application every year. You really do need to show your funders that, you know, you're, you're really in, in, in deep with the community. Here's what we're seeing now. And we learn from that too. When I see applications come through, I didn't know certain things, right? So we're learning from you all as well. So we really, I think that's, that's a, a, just an, a, some advice on how to continue to receive funding once you do receive that initial grant from someone. So that one, that question is really important to you. I know it is. And it's hardest on us when we have to say no to certain times that you apply. One thing I think is probably the reality is that grants are not evergreen, which means you can't rely on them consecutively year after year. There are ones, and I'm glad to hear what Danielle said, that there's some that will get renewed over and over. And for the most part, grants, funders don't want to grant something one time and walk away. But they do want to see that at some point you have other plans for other funding sources. Maybe there's fundraising events that help provide um, a revenue for that particular program. But also grants, um, funders want to see there's other people participating in your program in terms of funders. So it is important to have a variety of grant um, funders to support your program so that it can be sustainable. That I know is the hardest because you are constantly, constantly looking for those new grants. So the outcomes that I think they've talked a little bit, the outcomes of what you get from your grants are stories. And those stories we want to hear because that makes our investment in you very powerful. So if you can, like you said, give us newsletters or send us an email on a story of somebody's life you changed, um, we like to pick those up too because we need to show to our leadership how the grant investments are making a difference. We don't just look at what's on paper or what a number shows. The story is just as important. So just think about that. I know it takes effort to um, farm a, ta a, a story, but it is important to try to find those real good nuggets. Fantastic, thank you. So the next question is, how does your grant processing view objectives and what do you look for? So in that particular aspect, we do want to see that there's a minimum of three to four objectives of what you'll accomplish during the course of the grant. Usually my grants or the grants at Kaiser Permanente are one year. But what we want to see is what outcomes from those objectives come from the work that you're going to do. So sometimes we want to know what the reach is. How many people will you be touching? How many individuals will you know have the access to the program you're asking for funding? Or it could be a capacity grant. I know I want to talk a little bit too about capacities. When you ask for money to help improve something within your organization, it could be, I think I heard somebody talking about needing the, the latest data collection software. You, you feel like you're still in an archaic way of collecting your data. Well, a grant could help fund purchasing that software. And that kind of funding is to build the capacity of the organization. And that's helpful because it's not a program per se, but it's a way to give the, the organization a boost in how they operate. Maybe you could see more numbers when you get that software. Maybe you can um, realign the staffing so that less of it is in the, you know, the paper manual version and you're more automated. But those are just ways that you can also think, what's the impact from these objectives? And think about what three things are gonna happen and make that impact. And those are what we wanna see in your objectives. I think you said everything really well. I, I would just also add to be very clear 
um, you know, tell your story very clearly. Um, you know, the, the, the foundations have different ways to review applications. And um, I think if you could just very, be very clear on how you're delivering your objectives, you know, and, and as she mentioned, the impact's really important. But just, I think, be clear is, is what I would just add. Yeah, so um, just like you would do your research on the funder, if you um, are applying with Stater Brothers Charities for the first time, we're going to also do our research on you. So what we look at is your website, any social media. So I would make sure your website's up to date. If you have social media, obviously it's not mandatory, but just making sure everything's up to date because if we have to search really hard to learn more about your organization, how is the community gonna find you? How are your clients gonna find you? Um, so I would just make sure your information is very accessible. Um, and two, when it comes to filling out the application, what are you putting down or what are you asking for that's going to make you stand out from the rest of the other applicants? We get hundreds of applications. So what, what do you do or what are you going to do that's going to make you stand out? And for us, it really is, again, being clear, concise. You have to put a little bit of effort into it. Don't make it too short. Don't make it too long. Don't make it a novel, but make it clear and concise, enough that we could understand what you're doing, and two, the outcomes. You know, how is our investment going to impact your organization and how is it going to impact the community? We want to see what is the difference you are making. Because really, you all are the experts. You're going to know the needs of the community better than anyone. So what are the needs in your community, what are the issues, and what are you doing to solve it, and how can we support you in that? Um, another thing we look out to, um, it's definitely if we are funding someone for the first time, um, we look for stewardship. Are you being good stewards of, the, of your funds? So we do look at um, your financials. We'll look at your 990s. Um, we, I'm, some of you are probably familiar with it, but I use GuideStar a lot um, for just a, you know, a high-level overview of organizations. So if you are on GuideStar, make sure you're up to date. We have come across nonprofits on GuideStar that said their tax-exempt status have been revoked. So um, just make sure you're up to date on all your financials. Thank you so much. In addition to that, you know, it's, we have a lot of nonprofit organizations that have their feeding programs, and, and it's just a every day, every month, and so forth. And so I know that funders always look into funding new ideas, new programs, and a way that they can do that is enhancing their, their operations. And what I mean by that is if they have a food pantry integrating another program, perhaps CalFresh, and to Telling the, the foundation, hey, not only are we providing food, but we are also offering them CalFresh assistance. And they can go to the grocery stores and pick their grocery items themselves. So making it more of a wraparound service and showing that you're enhancing, not just the same thing over and over, because we're trying to end hunger, I know, but there are other services, other other programs that we can integrate to make it more of a holistic, make it more of a wraparound, like I mentioned. Thank you so much. Any other uh, additional uh, information that we, you would like to include? Yeah, and that was a, that was a great point. I love, it. and you know, not necessarily new, but how are you deepening right the effects that you're having with your clients? And and one other thing to add is is partnerships. You know, if you are now providing diapers to a nonprofit that's working for, you know, working with women who have just recently, you know, come out of the system and they're trying to get their kids back, and that's a new partnership for you, but you're providing such a vital resource. I mean, things like that also, you know, show that you're collaborating, you're, you're really, you know, involved in the community, you know what the needs are, and, and together, wow, what an amazing way to, to help that family who no longer has to spend those that those precious dollars on diapers right because you're providing that support so things like that you know just and, and that's what you really need to also you should include in your stories and should put down there I know there's a question in Bank of America's application about partnerships and collaborations and whenever someone leaves that blank I start going blank because I'm like come on people <laughs> I know you're you've got a partner you, you, you know we all got to work together here in the community so you know if there's ever a, a question on there and you leave it blank 
that's also telling the funder something, if you know what I mean, when you, when you don't include an opportunity to tell your story. So always look at every single question and, and try to have a, a response in there because that's what the funders are looking for as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. So like I mentioned, CalFresh Service is another uh, program that you can integrate to your operations. And we have our CalFresh coordinator in the back, Paulina. If you have not been Ooh, connected with her, Paulina. she can come out to your food pantry table and offer your clients. And that's an added program to your program that you can mention on your grant. So before we open it up to questions, any other comments? I just... I wanted to reinforce what they've already said, but I'm so glad we have actually the, the enrollment. But what we know about your client, we know that if they're coming to you for food, they have other needs. There's no doubt that's not the only thing they're seeking. So you are going to stay true to your mission, and whatever you do, we don't want you to mission drift, but what you can tell us is who else do you collaborate with? We already heard it. We've already heard that word, but you have to tell us how do you help serve that same client by referring them because you have a really good linkage to another nonprofit doing work in an area that that individual needs. We need to see that because we know, just like funders can't do this alone, we need to all be doing this together to serve the person. And that person is, in a whole way, has definitely other needs. So I wanna just underscore that. Please, please, if you haven't already, just look at a map in the geography of where you're located or where your services are and see what's the closest other service for social need, right? Housing, transportation, childcare, um, job training. There's need, you know, beyond, and you guys see this every day, so I don't, I'm not trying to tell you what you already see every day, but you've got to help us paint the picture that you are also in the game of addressing the whole person. You're not serving them directly with everything they need, but you're helping them navigate or know somebody they can talk to. Liquid gold, ladies and gentlemen. And so we will go ahead and open it up for the audience to ask any questions. Do we have any hands, any questions? Okay, we have a hand over here. The microphone is coming to you. <laughs> when and how often can you apply? That's, that's a wonderful question. And, and unfortunately, all the funders are different. Um, so for example, Bank of America, we do two uh, RFPs a year. Uh, in January, February, we open it up for economic mobility focused on the individual. So it would be um, basic needs, uh, health, um, job training. Uh, and then in the summertime, which is coming up pretty soon, we're opening it up for economic mobility for the, for the community. So that is small business, affordable housing, arts and culture. So again, every, every funder is different, but that's, that's ours real quick. Uh, so for Stater Brothers Charities, our grant cycle is currently open. It will be closing uh, July 31st. Um, when we look at funding, we are focused on hunger relief, children's well-being, education, health, veterans and active service members, and pet well-being. So we have a very broad uh, funding and giving. So um, there's usually an opportunity to, to focus on one of those areas. And I gave you a cheat sheet. On the back of the document you have on your table, there's just this blue box that tells you. Um, but our grants are by invitation only, and I have a couple of different ways to get grant funding. Locally, that's what I'm. you probably will link into the most likely. But I also access regional grants, which are from Pasadena, and national office grants out of Oakland. And that's a year round for me, so I'm constantly looking for nonprofits doing work in an area that our organization's looking to fund. So it, it can be year round, but the responding to your need, you're asking us to look at what you want us to fund, um, in the blue box, you can see it. Great, thank you so much. That was Loveland Jubilee in San Bernardino. Thank you so much.
This is Robert Sasser from Helping Hands out of uh, Canyon Lake. Uh, we work a warehouse out of um, Lake Elsinore. Uh, I constantly get a request that I'm having trouble with, and I'll ask you, I'll put, give you some information first. We accept everybody. If somebody needs food, they get food. If we can't get them what they need, we'll get them to a place where they can get that food. We take a lot of people to pantries that have the ability to drive. Uh, same with our volunteers. Anybody can volunteer with us. We don't care what it is. You show up, we'll put you to work. Right now, we have about 300 volunteers. 175 of them are active every month. Here's a question. You guys are asking right now, <coughs> excuse me, not you personally, but grants right now are, are asking for um, what is your diversity, equity, and inclusivity program? How do you have one when you're a nonprofit and no one's paid? So I think when it comes to that question, um, we're, we're, we're actually obviously looking for opportunities for people to grow and develop. So we're looking at your board members. You have a board. Um, and you know a lot of times we want, you know, I think as a nonprofit, you look at opportunities to have the board reflect the community. Uh, if you're serving, you know, again, everyone, then you probably should have almost everyone on your board, right? A, a person of, you know, representing that those different parts of the community. So it's really just a way for, for you know, us to, to just have that conversation about what does your board look like? You know, what does your executive staff look like? But if you're a staff of one, it's a staff of one, and we understand that as well. So it's just a, an opportunity for nonprofits to look at things a little bit, you know, just as they look at who they're serving. Um, but it doesn't mean necessarily that you will or will not get a grant, just how you respond to that question. It's more just something that um, some funders have, you know, looked at in terms of their corporate side, and, and it comes down to the local side sometimes. Okay. Yeah. Need a microphone. So, ask him yet to. We serve 11 communities. We have a board of 22 people. Do you know how tough it is to get 22 people together for a board meeting? Right, no, and I think really what what that question is trying to help align is the population you serve, and again, the makeup of that you know, does the board reflect that? Does the staff reflect that? Because serving people that look more like who your client is is better aligned. It's not to say that it has to, but it's better aligned. And just sometimes it just looks opposite, right? When you're serving a type of client, and let's just say it's transitional age youth, and everybody there is, you know, over 65. It, it was 40 years since they were youth. Then there may be something missing. We need to see that there's a younger, somebody that maybe came from, I know we use the word lived experience, that may or may not resonate, but somebody who has a better pulse on the population you're serving is something that is important for us to look at. The overall makeup of your organization, board and staff, volunteers, should reflect who you serve. That's really kind of what it's saying in the nutshell. Thank you.